Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and this is just a brief preface to explain that this video essay originally aired in 2019 as a segment in episode 20 of Dark Souls 3 Let's Talk Lore, but I figured it deserved to be its own video, and so here we are. What, you may be asking, makes this video essay different from the dozens of video essays that are already out there talking about Soma? Well, whereas most such video essays explore the story of Soma from a detached perspective, this video essay explores the story of the game from an experiential perspective. That is, by examining the experience of existential dread through a health scare I had back in 2019. In other words, and to put it simply, I thought I was dying, even though... Thankfully, I was wrong. And I'm pointing this out because when this video essay originally aired, several viewers commented to say that they were concerned that there was something seriously wrong with me. So again, I'm here to just let you know that it's all good. I'm fine. I'm healthy. Um, it's four years later. Nothing is wrong. So you can hopefully enjoy the video with that in mind. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video. Back in 2015, when I was recording Dark Souls 2 Let's Talk Lore, I was a heavy smoker. At that point in time, I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, and had been for several years. In the overall, I had been a smoker at that point for about 15 years, despite having tried to quit on multiple occasions. For those who watched my second ever playthrough for this channel, my blind playthrough of Bloodborne, you might remember me talking about this. Excuse me for one second. Just popping a piece of nicotine gum in my mouth. It is now day 18 um, of having quit smoking for me. Thanks in no small part to the nicotine gum. Um, one of the, the things I did a lot while playing Souls games is I smoked. Obviously, uh, not something I've ever done while... Um, doing commentary, but say for my Dark Souls 2 Let's Talk Lore series, uh, essentially at the end of every episode I would have a cigarette before recording the next one. So this is um, essentially my substitute for that. Just prior to starting that playthrough, I finally managed to quit smoking, but only by engaging in nicotine replacement therapy. That is by chewing 4 mg nicotine gum whenever I otherwise would have been smoking a cigarette. When watching or listening to pretty much any of my videos from that period, you can see and hear me chewing nicotine gum. 
Eventually, I switched over to the 2mg gum and later still to the 1mg nicotine lozenges, but despite my best efforts, I struggled to ditch nicotine altogether. At least until this past August when I finally managed to do it by replacing nicotine lozenges with sugary mint lozenges. I was finally free of nicotine, but it was also around the same period that I started to notice an odd sensation on the left side of my face. Initially, I was not overly concerned about this, because I assumed it was simply a dental issue. And this is where some additional context becomes necessary, as dental care in Canada is not covered by provincial insurance plans, in spite of the fact that, according to the Canada Health Act, these public plans are supposed to cover all medically necessary services and procedures. So even though dentists will be the first ones to tell you that their services are medically necessary, they have always maintained to the government that their services do not constitute medically necessary services or procedures, so that they can continue to realize larger profits from the provision of such services. So if you find yourself in a hospital that has an oral surgeon on staff, and you are in excruciating pain from a dental issue, then yes, you might be able to have your dental work covered. But such a scenario is not only exceedingly rare, it is also far from ideal, as it's much cheaper and far less painful to address such issues before they become so severe. For the millions of Canadians who cannot afford routine visits to the dentist, however, such preventative care is simply out of reach. I was, until late 2012, one of those Canadians. That is, for reasons I won't get into here, I spent much of the early 2000s living in poverty, and so I could not afford to go to the dentist for routine checkups. Equally, it was only recently that I developed good dental hygiene habits, so while my inability to routinely go to the dentist played a significant role in what happened to me, I certainly didn't do myself any favors. Nevertheless, I didn't exactly have a dentist or hygienist to scold me into developing better habits. All of this is to say that in September of 2012, when I started graduate school and thus became a TA, I also became a member of the local 3903 branch of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, or QB3903 for short. Thanks to the members who came before me, this also meant that I now had access to a dental insurance plan. So in December of 2012, when one of my teeth split in two, I was able to visit a dentist and for the first time in my adult life, I didn't have to worry about how I was going to pay for my visit. As it turned out, I had something like 20 cavities that needed to be filled, which I had done over the next few months. The most severe of these cavities, in the tooth which split in two, required a root canal. But while some additional procedures were required in the year or two that followed, it appeared at the time that my worst dental issues were behind me. It was in this context that, when I first felt the odd sensation on the left side of my face, I assumed it was simply a dental issue. Accordingly, when I went to my dentist's office for a routine checkup in late October, I raised concerns about this. I was told that everything was fine, despite my insistence to the contrary. They did, however, try to sell me Invisalign braces to address the crowding of my lower teeth. Evidently, they wanted to ensure that I was using my dental insurance coverage to its fullest extent before I graduated and lost that coverage. Having been told that nothing was awry, however, I went about my business and tried to forget about it. But this odd sensation wasn't going away, and in fact, it was starting to become more pronounced and more painful. In January, I had also begun to lose weight, which wasn't entirely unexpected given some of the lifestyle changes I had initiated, but the extent of my weight loss was concerning. I was, at this time, still using candy lozenges as a replacement for nicotine lozenges, as a means of sort of tricking myself into thinking that I was still getting my daily nicotine fix. I theorized at the time that the pain, which I was back to thinking was coming from my gums, was probably caused by all the sugar in those candy lozenges. So I finally forced myself to ditch the candy lozenges, hoping that the pain would subside in short order as a result. It did not, and I was back to not knowing what the heck was going on with my body. Then in February, I felt a lump at the point where my cheek meets my gums, on the upper left side of my face, and it felt like my stomach had sunk to my feet. This was the source of the pain I was now feeling constantly. Touching my cheek from the outside revealed the size of the growth, which was considerable. I felt like such an idiot. For months, my body was telling me that something was wrong, and I had ignored these warnings for far too long. I called my family doctor and expressed major concern about my situation. She agreed to see me a few days later. Before I saw her, I wrote down in my notebook everything that I thought might be even remotely relevant to my diagnosis. Here's what I wrote in my notebook.
I thought I had oral cancer, arising out of the fact that I spent almost four years chewing on nicotine gum or sucking on nicotine lozenges. There was a certain tragic irony to this, I thought at the time, as I was principally motivated to quit smoking for health reasons, and the only thing which allowed me to quit smoking seemed to have made me gravely ill. I tried to put such thoughts aside, but I just couldn't do it. I was hoping that my doctor would reassure me that it was nothing serious, but after examining me, she admitted to not knowing what the growth was, and that really freaked me out. That same day, the 27th of February, she sent me for x-rays and blood work at a nearby hospital. It was not only bitterly cold that day, it was also snowing non-stop in what ended up being a record snowfall. I wept as I walked through massive piles of snow on my way to the hospital, thinking that the end was probably near. The x-rays and blood work ordered by my doctor apparently revealed nothing, so she scheduled me for a CAT scan, the earliest opening for which was not until June. Meanwhile, the lump was growing and its rate of growth seemed to be increasing. Feeling increasingly desperate, I went to my dentist's office to ask for an emergency appointment so that I could ask them to definitively tell me whether or not this was a dental issue. After inspecting me, the dentist said he didn't know what the lump was and ordered another x-ray. He then referred me to an oral surgeon who, once again, could not see me until June. Feeling more desperate still, I called my doctor and asked if she could refer me to a different oral surgeon, whether or not their services were covered by Ontario's public health plan. So again, even though Canada is supposed to have a single-tier healthcare system, this is yet another instance in which having money, or a private insurance plan in my case, permits one to receive medical treatment sooner than they otherwise would within the public system. Systemic inequalities aside, I was so desperate for a diagnosis that I was willing to pay whatever I could to get someone to finally take me and my concerns seriously. In the weeks leading up to all this, I had spent much of my idle time pondering the story of Soma, simultaneously the worst and best game to have on your mind while struggling to come to grips with your own mortality. I had originally intended to discuss Soma in this episode to add context to our ongoing discussion about the Deep, the Abyss, and their relation to one another, but this game is, I think, equally relevant in helping us to think more deeply about another of Dark Souls 3's central themes, the idea that sometimes it's okay to let things die. Soma was developed by Frictional Games and released in 2015. And though I heard about the game at the time, I knew it only by its reputation as a horror game, having been developed by the same studio responsible for Amnesia, The Dark Descent. While I do enjoy horror games, my gaming time is increasingly limited these days, so before I commit myself to playing through a game, there has to be something about it which really speaks to me. While eventually, Soma would really and truly speak to me, I passed on it back in 2015. Then, in August of 2016, I released an episode of Aegon Rants called Fallout 4, Final Fantasy VII, and Brainhood, wherein I argued that Fallout 4 uncritically reproduced simplistic assumptions concerning the nature of the self, the notion that the body does not matter, and that we are our brains, and nothing more. Several viewers, including Sir Micho, Jack Kelly, and Kashiro, left comments on this video suggesting that I check out Soma. At the time, I feared that this would be yet another game which reproduced the same tired assumptions, and I felt that I simply didn't have the energy at that time anyway to confront another game of that sort. But when I saw that Soma was the free PlayStation Plus game for this past December 2018, I jumped at the chance to check it out. What I found most remarkable about Soma was not the fact that, much like Fallout 4, it reproduces these same assumptions. Instead, I was most taken aback by the fact that I didn't care because it allowed them to do some truly compelling things with the narrative. Before I explain what I mean by that though, I should warn all the viewers who have not yet played Soma that I am about to spoil the game's central plot, something which is best experienced by playing the game for yourself and immersing yourself in its world. The game even has a safe mode which permits you to ignore monsters in favor of focusing on piecing together the story yourself. Though, for the record, I only used the safe mode after my initial playthrough in order to capture footage for this segment. It's no longer free to download on the PlayStation Store, but if you are even remotely interested in questions like, what is it that makes us human? This game is more than worth the price of admission. So, if you've not yet played the game, go play it, and return to this segment when you're done. Having said all that, even though we're not going to cover the entirety of the game, Major spoilers begin in 3, 2, 1. The 
the game starts with the protagonist, Simon Jarrett, being awakened by a phone call from a man named David Munchie. Munchie confirms that Simon is going to make it for his brain scan at Pace Laboratories, and reminds him that he needs to drink tracer fluid in order to facilitate the scan. Then the player is given control over Simon, who needs to scour his apartment in order to find the tracer fluid. This segment serves as the game's tutorial, in that it teaches you not only that throughout the game, you will need to search every nook and cranny for items that are vital for progression, but also that the game's story can, likewise, be gleaned by thoroughly exploring one's environment. By exploring Simon's apartment, we learn that he was severely injured in a car accident, an accident which also claimed the life of his friend, Ashley Hall. Simon is not only haunted by the loss of Ashley, his brain is still hemorrhaging, and without a major medical breakthrough of some sort, this will almost certainly prove fatal in a matter of weeks. We learn that Simon is from Toronto, Canada, where I was born and where I've spent most of my life. This sort of blew my mind, as I don't think I've ever played a game that was explicitly set in Toronto. In fact, if I had known this back in 2015 or 2016, I probably would have played this game much sooner. After all, in spite of the fact that I obviously cannot relate to having a fatal brain injury, this made Simon instantly relatable to me. I don't know if Jared Zeus, Simon's voice actor, is from Toronto himself, but he even pronounces the name of the city correctly. That is, by not pronouncing the second T, as in Toronto, as opposed to Toronto, which is how most people who are not from here pronounce it. Interestingly, there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into this, as Thomas Grip of Frictional Games explained during his 2016 GDC talk. So, so, okay, so the question is why set the, the game in Toronto, Canada? So, so the most frequent question we, we've had, <laughs> I think, normal, um, is that, well, we, we thought through a different uh, various uh, locations, and we knew that it was going to take place in the Atlantic Ocean. So the, the, the site where you're going to be at had to be near the Atlantic Ocean. And we had already had English characters, so we felt like, okay, no, you know, or British characters, so no, no British characters. And then we thought, okay, let's make them American, but you know, everyone has American characters, so okay, let's make them Canadian. And then that, that's how we went. Simon hops on the subway, which appears far grungier than Toronto's actual subway system. When Simon arrives at the lab, he finds an empty office, which conveniently allows us to learn more about the brain scan to which we're about to submit ourselves. We learn that David Munshi and his co-author are graduate students at York University. Okay, this game is just messing with me now. Munshi, a graduate student at York University, has enrolled Simon in an experimental research program, which involves using a given subject's brain scan to create a model of their brain. This model is then used to develop an ideal medical treatment for that patient, ostensibly taking the guesswork and trial and error out of medical treatment. Simon meets Munchi, who initiates the brain scan. And then this happens. All files in order. Will this hurt? It's just a scan. It'll hurt about as much as getting your picture taken. Indians thought cameras would steal their souls. Is that so? Well, let's hope they're wrong. <laughs> Ready? Say cheese. Mr. Munchie? Did something go wrong? This isn't funny. I guess we're not in Toronto anymore. What the heck happened here? Initially, I had assumed that we were inside of Munchie's simulation, but I couldn't find a way to make sense of that. As I played through the first few areas of the game, however, the reality of the situation slowly became clearer to me. First, as was noted in the clip we just watched a minute ago, and as is made clear within the first hour of gameplay, it's not just that we're no longer in Toronto, but rather that we're actually at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. In light of the technological advances that would be needed in order to both make it possible and feasible to build a facility of this sort on the ocean floor, moreover, it is also apparent that the year is no longer 2015. In his search for answers, Simon restores power to the building in which he finds himself and manages to briefly make contact with a woman named Catherine Chun, who directs him to seek out the comm center. In the comm center, Simon meets a robot who refers to himself as Carl Semkin and believes himself to be human. In an adjacent room, however, we find Semkin's body, 
suggesting that his consciousness was somehow transferred from his human body into that of a robot, producing what is called a mockingbird. The unanswered questions continue mounting for Simon. Simon raises some of these questions with Catherine. Hey, are you there? I found the dome ceiling. Oh, that's better. Simon, was it? Uh, Jared, Simon Jared. Hi, Simon. I'm Catherine. Have you figured out what's going on yet? Me? I was hoping you'd have some answers. I probably have some. What do you want to know? Where do you even begin? I mean, what is this place? How did I get here? And, and why do the robots talk like they're people? Well, you're at Upsilon, clearly. Have you never been there before? Where did you work? The Grimoire in Toronto. Is that really important? No, I mean, where did you work at Pathos 2? I don't know what that is. That's unexpected. Did you come directly from Toronto? Yeah, I did. And it was very unexpected. Have you seen any people? Like staff or field technicians? Only robots. Crazy ones. This is also strange. You're telling me. What was that? No! What's going on? I think this place is about to collapse. What do I do? Simon, come to Lambda. Uh, how, how do I get there? There are shuttle trains connecting all the sites. Find one and come here. I'll wait for you. Shit, shit, shit. Where do I... Where should I... Oh, fuck! Adding to the question Simon just raised, a diving suit capable of withstanding the enormous pressure of the ocean floor seemingly just happened to appear on his body, just as we needed it. This will, however, be explained shortly. When we find the shuttle to Lambda, we are treated to a video which tells us a little bit more about where we are. Welcome to Pathos 2, your expressway to the stars. What's started as a thermal mining operation in the 60s, has now become home to the Omega Space Gun, the world's most affordable way to launch satellites and deep space probes. Our unique Atlantic Ocean location allows for this gigantic coil gun, running longer than a marathon, to safely launch projectiles without risk of damaging the payload with risky combustion. The station's science and has a diverse staff of engineers and scientists. Together, they are able to produce when Simon finally arrives at Lambda, he finds that Catherine also appears to be a robot. No, not you two. I was really hoping you were human. Don't let the circuitry fool you. I was human once. Can't take any more. This is... everything's fucked. I give up. There's nothing left. Calm down. It's not the end of the world. You sure? It sure is how it looks like it. For all I know, there's no one left except for me. What do you mean? I'm right here. Don't take this the wrong way, but I meant any humans left except for me. Have you looked at yourself lately? You're a walking, talking diving suit with some electronics left on for good measure. I... I don't... You don't want to think about it? We'll start thinking about it. I... I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this. I want out. Before you do anything hasty, could you help me with something? What? I was trying to find out what happened with my project when that brute knocked me to the ground. Your project? How could anything possibly matter when you know you're a stupid robot in a stupid dead world? Okay, focus. I need you to fix me so I can get back to work. Then you can sulk as much as you want. You gotta be kidding, right? I think I have a better chance of building myself a time machine than of putting you back together. I just need to access the computer. Oh, is that an Omnitool you're carrying? Oh, the door opener? I picked it up at Upsilon where I woke up. I don't have to do. Plug it into the terminal. The Omnitool is ready now. Should be easy enough. Just pick up the chip and slide it into the Omnitool. Why does a robot chip fit a door opener? It's standardized connect. 
Uh, Catherine? All right, let's give this a try. What's the project about? My project? Oh, well, I saved all the people on the station as brain scans and put them into an artificial world. We were going to launch it into space to save it from, uh, well, all of this. Are you telling me that you were going to launch a computer world filled with people into space? Yes. It was just a pet project at first, but it got really serious after the comet took out the surface. Then, suddenly, it became very important, and it was officially named the Ark. That's appropriate. How far did you get? I don't know. That version of me that I am. It came from a scan I did pretty early on. The living Catherine could very well have finished the project and launched it. I guess she could even still be alive. Uh, weird thought. So the talk and so it is that we not only have our goal to help Catherine with her project, but also a series of answers to the questions raised by Simon, even if he does not yet realize it. First, it is now the year 2104, and all life on the surface of the Earth has been eradicated by a comet, which left the staff of Pathos II as the only surviving humans. Second, we learn that human consciousnesses can now be stored on something called a cortex chip. Third, these consciousnesses can be derived from brain scans and can therefore exist alongside the person from whom the scan originated. And fourth, we learn, as Catherine puts it, that Simon is a walking, talking, diving suit with some electronics slapped on for good measure. When considered together, it becomes apparent that the Simon we are currently playing as is no longer the same Simon with which we started the game. The game changed our perspective at the moment of the brain scan from the original Simon, who we'll call Simon 1, to the Simon we're playing as now, who we'll call Simon 2. You are one of Dr. Munchie's templates, a legacy scan. Okay, that's it. Wow, that was fun. That's a relief. I'm still figuring this out, so. It was freaky, so many lights. What do we do now? Paul and I are going to run tests for a week or so, and then we'll work out a roadmap to your recovery. Well, I feel excited. Can't wait to get back to the living. We've worked everything out. Everything is legal. Vouched for by Dr. Peak and Professor Wei. Oh, that's great news. No big change in medication. You'll be taking an aspirin every morning, but that's about it. Paul worked out a diet with some variations you should try out. You can continue doing physical therapy. Also, there's some extra cardio training every other day. Okay, getting complicated. Don't worry, it's really not. We're gonna keep an eye on you every week, so we'll be able to adjust the plan if needed. The model was sound. It should have worked. It's not your fault, David. I really wish things had turned out differently. Yeah, me too. I was supposed to save you. Hey, you got my brain on file. Maybe you can put it to some use. <laughs> yeah, who knows? You'd be okay with that? Using it for my research? Sure. It's like a part of me lives on or something. Like a donated organ. You know what sucks about dying? What? The crash. Everything up till now, the brain damage, you guys, everything, has made my life so much more real. I started thinking about all the things I was going to do. I'd never been more excited to be alive. All that hope. Wasted. This is why a diving suit just happened to appear on our body when we needed it. Simon 2's mind was projecting the body with which he was familiar onto the body in which he now finds himself, because the associated stress might have otherwise caused his mind to reject the new body, leading to his death. So it's not a perfect explanation, but whereas the likes of Fallout 4 completely sidestep, 
the question of whether the human mind could possibly cope with the trauma of losing its original body, Soma actually accounts for this in the game itself. At the same time, as I noted earlier, Soma does make some assumptions in line with those on display in Fallout 4, some of which can be said to be problematic. First, it assumes not only that it is somehow possible to extract memories from brain scans, but also that second, our sense of self is rooted entirely in those memories. And finally, that third, as a consequence of the first two assumptions, to imprint these memories onto a cortex chip is essentially to create a perfect copy of the subject's mind, and depending on your interpretation of the game's story, to create a perfect copy of the self as well. I'm not going to delve into the specific reasons why some of these assumptions are a little bit problematic, because this segment is far too lengthy as it is, but if you're interested in why it strains credulity to imagine that we might one day be capable of extracting memories from brain scans, I would recommend checking out Joe Dumit's 2004 book, Picturing Personhood, Brain Scans and Biomedical Identity. I'm pointing all this out to be fair to the likes of Fallout 4, to be analytically consistent given my past criticism of Fallout 4, but as I noted earlier, these issues don't really bother me here as much because of the masterful manner with which these assumptions are employed in service of the narrative. Before I present an example of this, it's important to keep in mind that we are skipping over a ton of important details here, including the entire subplot concerning the monsters running amok through the station, and the AI responsible for them. Nevertheless, I am desperately trying to keep this segment brief, because while I can talk about this game for hours, I don't want the segment to run too long. With that said, consider, for instance, the conflict which arises when Simon 2's inability or unwillingness to understand that brain scans can only produce copies of consciousnesses rubs up against the need to transfer his consciousness into a new body. That is, Simon 2 and Catherine 2 learn that Catherine 1, the human whose brain scan produced Catherine 2, never managed to launch the Ark into space using the Omega space gun, which is located in the layer of the ocean known as the Abyss, while Simon 2's scuba suit, which is fused to his body, is capable of withstanding the ocean's pressure at a depth of 200 meters, the Omega space gun is located in the abyssal zone at a depth of over 4,000 meters, where the pressure would almost certainly crush him. In theory, Simon's cortex chip could have been physically removed from his current body and then installed in the body wearing the power suit, but Simon too cannot remove his own cortex chip and maintain control over his current body. And Catherine can't do it for him because well, she doesn't have a body. So Catherine convinces him to submit to a brain scan in order to copy his consciousness, and then paste it into the new body, thus creating Simon 3. As with the transition from Simon 1 to Simon 2, the player takes control over the new Simon, except that this time, both Simons are in the same room, giving new meaning to the phrase out-of-body experience, and forcing the player to make an incredibly difficult decision. This is crazy. Don't worry, it'll work. Just make sure it's all bunched together with the structure gel connecting all the parts. All right, try activating the seat from the terminal again. I can't believe we're doing this. It will be fine. Then why don't we put you in the suit? I was going to suggest that if you refused. You'd go without me. I need to do this, Simon. This is important. I need to launch the Ark. You'd really do it? Change body? Yes. If you want to stay here, I'm not going to stand in your way. I don't want to tell you what to do. What would it be like before? Close my eyes and then... And then open them again. All right. Let's do it. Thank you, Simon. Go sit in the pilot seat in the next room. You might need to boot it up. Sorry about any discomfort. This should be over soon. It's like having your picture taken. But with the most expensive camera in the world. You know, Indian saw photos would steal their souls. In this case, they'd be right. <laughs> Diagnosis or something? 
What was that? No, I it just... Why was it still talking? It's the same like before. Catherine, why was he still talking? That's how it works, you know that. What do you mean? You know it's not magic. You were copied. The sleeping Simon in the sea was copied, and now... You are here, just like Simon lived on in Toronto. God damn you, Kath. Two Simons? There can't be two Simons. What did you think would happen? That you were going to take my mind and put it into another body, like a brain transplant. I'm sorry, it wouldn't work that way. You realize how messed up this is? Please, I didn't mean to upset you. How did you expect me to react to this shit? Please stop. You're fucking disgusting. What's going to happen to him? He'll sleep for a while, a few days. And then what? Wake up in this fucking nightmare again? All alone? So cruel. Well, what do you want me to do with him? Make friends? Let him know that we have to leave him behind when we go into the abyss? What if... What if he didn't need to wake up? You do that? I don't know. Maybe. There. I set it up for you. Hit the switch if you want to drain his battery. He'll die within a minute. I'd rather not stay plugged in any longer. This is just one of the many difficult choices the game forces on the player, and I both love and hate frictional games for forcing these decisions on me. We will return to this decision in just a minute, but first, it's worth asking what this mind duping would look and feel like from the other perspective, that of the person whose mind is being copied. And though the game switches our perspective to that of the new Simon during the first two body switches, this is subverted by the game's ending, as our perspective remains with Simon 3 and does not switch to Simon 4 until after the credits. I saw it. It finished loading just before it launched. Yeah, I saw. Then why are we still here? Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. We both did. Just like Simon and Omicron. Just like the man who died in Toronto a hundred years ago. No, this is bullshit. We came all this way. We launched the Ark. I know it sucks. But our copies are up there. Catherine and Simon are both safe on the Ark. Be happy for them. Are you crazy? We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Simon. I'm proud of what we did. We made sure that something of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history survived, that something lives on. No, 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 no. Fuck this. Fuck Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck you, Catherine! You lied! And I believed in you! I trusted you! You said we're getting on the fucking Ark! We are on the Ark, you idiot! I didn't lie! I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance! Fuck! Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? Let's return to the scene which immediately follows the switch from Simon 2 to Simon 3, which depicts Simon 3 and Catherine 2 
descending into the abyss, as it was this scene which forced me to reevaluate my presuppositions about what makes one human. I mean, these are essentially robots masquerading as humans, robots animated by imprinted human consciousnesses, and yet, in this scene, they engage in a conversation which, despite the sci-fi context in which it takes place, conveys human meaning and recalls memories in a manner which strikes me as being eminently human. Have we figured out what happens when we die? Is that even possible? If there's some kind of afterlife, do you think my place is taken? The real me died like a hundred years ago. Is there still room for me? And what about the Simon I killed at Omicron? What do you think, Catherine? Is there a heaven full of redundant copies of the same people? Is there someone up there who call me an imposter? It's dumb luck, right? That I woke up in the right body. I basically flipped a coin, and if I had called the wrong side, I'd be rotting away at Omicron. I mean, there's nowhere to know, right? You didn't hit the make sure Simon wakes up in the right body switch, did you? Not that you would know. I mean, he would still claim to be the right Simon. Christ. This is awful. We did an awful fucking thing. And you wouldn't mind. Why would you? How could you know that it's not me, the me that I am, the same that I've always been? Please say something. I don't want to think. Please. I don't know what to say. I don't want to upset you. Say anything. When I was little, I used to climb the stairs all the way to the top of the building. And I could still feel how I did it, you know, tuck my arm so I could push the heavy steel door open. Well, the first time that I dared go up there, I stepped out onto the roof and watched the smog rise and fall over Taipei. I got all the way up to the corner ledge and, you know, I felt the warm wind in my hair and the sun was setting and the streets below were shadowed by the tall buildings. The people pushing through the crowd flowed like paint from an artist's brush. Street food vendors filled the air with aromas of all my favorite foods. For a brief moment, I felt connected to the world in a way that I never had before. It was the most profound feeling of comfort and sense of belonging I could ever hope for. I really never felt the same way again, but I went up to the roof many times after. I'm not religious, but I can see why people would be. The privilege of being makes a strong case, at least every once in a while. Do you still feel that sense of awe? Even like this? Things are different, but we're still here. What's the point of going on? Everyone's gone. All the people still left are digital copies trapped in computers at the bottom of the sea. We'll never be able to rebuild or reclaim what we were. Are you really so unhappy being what you are, or is this about the man who went for a scan a hundred years ago? Both, I guess. When I was back in Toronto, even the worst case, the darkest futures I could predict, they at least included my previous life somehow. I feel so uprooted. There's nothing here that I recognize, nothing that makes me feel like I belong. Even if we make it to the Ark, would it be any different? I'd still be alone. No friends. No family. You could make new friends. I'm sure everyone would like to know the time traveler. If not, you still have... When contemplating his own existence, Simon 3 asks about the afterlife, and whether one exists. He notes that the real him, that is Simon 1, died a hundred years ago. So if there is an afterlife, is his place taken? It was existential questions of this sort, that is questions relating to one's existence, which consumed me in the weeks which followed my having found a lump on the left side of my face. 
While I have no issue with those who believe in an afterlife, I don't believe in the afterlife myself, even though I spent a lot of time wishing that I did while dealing with this health scare. I mean, as far as I'm aware, my death will be followed not by eternal bliss or damnation, but with oblivion, with nothingness. It was hard enough to come to grips with the fact that I will one day have to confront that reality, but the feeling that this confrontation was imminent was terrifying to me. I don't know that anyone is ever truly ready to die, of course, but I can certainly tell you that I am not. I am presently on the cusp of completing my PhD, the culmination of my journey through graduate school, a journey that has lasted the better part of a decade, and I didn't know whether I would have enough time to even finish that journey. What's more is that this journey is part of my larger aspiration to make a difference in the world, to help those who face injustices every day to achieve some measure of justice. And I don't think I've come even close to achieving this goal. I still have much work to do. I didn't know whether I would ever finish this series. And I know I often joke about the pace at which this series is going, and while I am truly not currently capable of moving things along any faster, it really did fill me with dread, the thought that one day soon, people would reach episode 19 or 20 of this series only to discover that I had passed away, and that I would never make another video again. <sighs> this also made me consider how people will remember me. I am not satisfied with my legacy, to be sure, but I did find it comforting to know that through this YouTube channel, people will at least be able to get a sense of who I am, who I was. I have always been true to who I am in the videos posted to this channel, and I have always been open with each of you about what, at that point in time, I might have been going through. In a sense then, this channel documents my most intense personal struggles with graduate school, depression, and life in general, and watching my videos chronologically can give you a sense of the highs and lows I experienced throughout this journey. On a more personal level, I've always wanted to start a family, and a few days before I found the lump, I was preparing to buy an engagement ring for my partner, as I was planning to propose to her on our one year anniversary. But when I found that lump, it forced me to reconsider my plan, as I wasn't even sure that we were going to have the chance to start a family, and it didn't seem fair to me to even propose to her in light of that uncertainty. In contrast then to one of the central themes of Dark Souls 3, that is, the idea that it's okay to let go, to let things die. I am simply not ready to die. Of course, I would not want to be an undead either, and thus to have a life without meaning, but I am not yet ready to die. I met with my oral surgeon on March 27, a few days before recording the first 2 hours and 30 minutes of this episode. After examining me, the surgeon looked at the x-ray taken by my dentist, and within a few seconds, he had identified the root canal mentioned earlier as the cause of my problems. He said the lump was most likely a radicular cyst, that is, a cyst arising from epithelial residues in the periodontal ligament as a consequence of inflammation usually following the death of the dental pulp. In other words, I had a dead tooth, and it was likely that attached to that tooth was the cyst, which had expanded into my sinuses. The cyst was badly inflamed and infected, so he recommended removing the tooth and the attached cyst as soon as possible, and having a biopsy to make sure that it was not malignant. I underwent surgery on April 9th, and when the biopsy results came in a week later, the growth was confirmed to be a benign radicular cyst, as the surgeon suspected. It took a few weeks for the swelling to subside, and I am still recovering from the surgery in some respects, but thankfully, it looks like I am going to be just fine. In light of all the existential dread I had dealt with in the preceding weeks, you can probably imagine the incredible sense of relief I felt. I was extraordinarily relieved, just so very happy, and so incredibly grateful to be alive. On the other hand, I felt terrible to have scared my loved ones with all of this, to have overreacted, really, to this health scare in a manner that was so incredibly dramatic. And perhaps most of all, I felt so very stupid to have ignored this problem for so long. And then I learned about the passing of Rolling Ewok, and I felt more guilty still. I had been so caught up in my own issues that I hadn't even noticed that I had not heard from one of my most engaged viewers for several months, who had last tweeted to me about being in the ICU, when I noticed that Rolling Ewok, whose given name was Christina, or Chris for short, hadn't tweeted since October of last year. I checked her other social media profiles. 
I learned that she passed away on October 10th, 2018, due to complications associated with the chronic illnesses which landed her in the ICU. She was just 31, a shade younger than me. I know this is the last thing she would have wanted to come out of her passing, but this just led me to think, what the fuck is so special about me? Why was Rolling Ewok forced to spend so much of her life fighting chronic illness? Well, I had virtually no physical health problems. Why am I still here while she is not? I know there's no answer to these questions. I just can't help but ask them. As in Soma, however, I guess it just comes down to the luck of the draw. I can't justify or explain the billions and billions of coin flips which happen to favor me, just as Simon 4 cannot explain how he somehow managed to be the only Simon to find his way onto the Ark. Ultimately, that's just the randomness of our existence, and even though the end result of all of those coin flips is that I am extraordinarily privileged in so many ways, there will come a day when I too will cease to exist. In the meantime, all I can do is try my best to leave the world a better place than I found it, by positively affecting the lives of others, whether through my research, my work as an educator, or through the content on my YouTube channel. I will forever be grateful to Rolling Ewok, just as I am to each and every one of you for watching this and for giving my work so much meaning. And please, listen to your body if it's trying to tell you that something isn't right, and take good care of yourselves.